Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2013 Destination Chautauqua County Debate Series. I'll be your moderator for today's debate as well as next week, and welcome to the very first one today. I'd first like to thank our uh, candidates, uh, Mr. Ed Karudis and uh, Mr. Dave Himmeline to, for joining us and the willingness to present their views and perspectives uh, to the elected office of county legislature for District 18. This uh, debate will be structured with questions presented by me to the candidates. Each uh, person will have an uh, opportunity to respond, but it'll be time, so we won't have run-ons. The candidates have been uh, given the topics, folks, but not the questions ahead of time, so when they hear the questions from me, it'll be the first time. Uh, earlier, we had a coin flip, and Mr. Hemline will be consider candidate number one as we go through the debate and Mr. Carutus will be number two. So at one point candidate one will respond and then candidate number two and then we'll reverse it as we go through the debate. There will be a section uh, uh, during the debate for your questions, the viewers. Uh, if you want to call in, let's see if we can get that number up here, you can call us at 753-5225 and uh, one of our staff will be screening calls. Now, if we get a ton of calls, which we hope we do, we're going to be selecting calls that maybe had uh, regarding questions that haven't been asked up till then, and uh, then they'll be presented in the later section. There we go, 753-5225 call-ins, but we'll let you know. But you, I, I guess you can call throughout the show. Uh, the, the questions will be screened, and then later in the show, during the third section, uh, we'll be uh, allowing your questions to be given to the candidates. I want to point out to everyone that the, the opinions today expressed by the candidates are those of the candidates, not necessarily mine, those of the studio or the staff. All right, throughout the year, uh, if you've been watching our programs here, especially on the Senior Report, we've brought in a variety of folks from county government, uh, department heads and so forth on the Senior Report every Saturday morning. Uh, it's become very clear to all of us the county government has become a very important um, aspect of all of our lives here in Chautauqua County. And we hope that through these two debates, today and next Saturday, <clears throat> that you, the viewership, will have an opportunity to more closely examine the candidates um, in a different way than you do in print, and that uh, we're going to help you determine who you're going to cast your vote for on November 5. So in just a moment, uh, I'm going to ask our first candidate to uh, tell them, tell a little bit about themselves and their position uh, for the uh, post of county legislature. So let's begin with candidate number one. And Mr. Himmeline, if you'd like to begin, please do. Thank you, Mr. Himmeline. As, as he has stated, my name is David Himmeline, and I'd like to give you just a, a brief background of uh, myself. I was raised in Finney Lake on a small dairy farm. After attending college, I started my career at Welch Foods, where I met and married my wife, Joan, and we raised three daughters in Finley Lake. As my father was a very active member of the Finley Lake Fire Department, I decided to also join the department and help the residents in my community. After 44 years, and I still am a member, I have held many elected positions on the business side up to president as well as positions on the operational side all the way through chief of department. On top of my work and activity in the fire department, I also ran for and was elected to the Minot Town Board where I served for two terms. I then decided that I needed to cut back somewhere to spend a little more time with my family. This was a result of my being actively involved in the Chautauqua County Fire Chiefs Association, including president in 1996, and sitting on the Chautauqua County Fire Advisory Board, where I was elected chairman in 2004 and 2005. While I was working in Westfield, I was also elected chairman of the Credit Committee and subsequent elected treasurer of the Westfield Area Federal Credit Union. I also served as a, serve right now, currently as a board member of the Mina Finney Lake Historical Society. I am an officer in Olive Lodge 575 Masons and Acacia Chapter 96, Order of Eastern Star. My career at Welch Foods came to an end, and when I retired after 41 and a half years, most recently as Processing Operations Supervisor, 
I thought at this point my life, I could finally sit back and relax just a little. <laughs> but that didn't happen. <laughs> Less than a month after retiring, I was approached to fill the vacancy in the county legislature for District 21. I couldn't refuse. And after an interview, I was selected to serve the district. During my three and a half years on the legislature, I have been a member of the Public Safety Committee, and I currently serve on the Audit and Control Committee, Chairman of the Public Facilities Committee, and the Assistant Majority Leader. Being a county legislature, legislator can be challenging and yet rewarding, both personally and professionally. But I have enjoyed serving the people of my current district and the county. And I ask the people in the new District 18 to vote for me to serve them for the next two years. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Karoudis. Thank you. Uh, my name's Ed Karoudis, and I'm running for the same seat, of course. Uh, I was also raised on a farm uh, in Sherman, New York. Uh, I was born and raised in Sherman. Uh, I also operated a farm. I owned and operated a farm for about 10 years. Uh, after that, uh, for various reasons, I left farming and uh, became a teacher, and I've been a teacher for 23 years. Uh, my family is very involved, has been, and is still very involved in small business as myself. Uh, I have a, that small business background gives me a good broad perspective uh, for business and labor. Uh, <clears throat> during my time at the school, the 23 years, uh, I've been uh, association president, uh, served on various committees. And as uh, president of the association up there, I've negotiated several contracts. And uh, as you know, negotiating contracts can be very uh, stressful, and, and you have to be able to work with people. I believe I've been able to work with uh, the administration up there as well as the board, and uh, I have not been a partisan person. Now, I was asked to run for this position, and after thinking about it, after thinking of the the things that have gone on in the legislature as far as partisan politics, I thought that would be a very good idea. Uh, and we have some problems here. We have uh, population loss, job loss, and you can uh, argue which came first, the chicken or the, or the egg, but it's a problem. One of the reasons our taxes are so high is because of that population and job loss. We need to reverse that if we're going to have a, a vital uh, economy and preserve the way of life that we've known here. And we can't do it with the tax base that we have. We have to have a little bit more. Uh, I, would, I would like to change that. We've had a legislator up there for many of them for many years, and it hasn't changed. It's only gotten worse. So we need some fresh ideas. We need to focus on what, can, what will keep our young people here, because they are our future. And I'd like to focus on jobs that will keep them here, as well as bring business in. Because after all, we can't educate all of our young people to do one thing, go to college, become a CEO, and expect them to stay here, because those Jobs are few and far between. As your legislator, I will bring good judgment, honesty. I won't use the job for my own personal gain and uh, uh, promote common sense government without partisan politics. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. All right, gentlemen, what we're going to do now, and folks that are, are watching, is we're going to pose some questions <coughs> to the candidates. Each candidate will have the opportunity to uh, respond to the question for two minutes. And after that, the, um, I will ask the, each candidate for a response to that question uh, after that. When we've uh, finished that question, we'll move on to the second question and uh, we will reverse the order where the second candidate will have an opportunity to uh, respond to the question, uh, next candidate, and then a response and response and then move right along. And you'll see that will be the way we'll do it. All right, so we're going to start with uh, candidate number one, Mr. Himmelein. And here's the question. Da, 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 da. Da, da. All right. I'll, I'll phrase this, and if you don't understand the question, I'll just simply ask you again. <laughs> um, Mr. Himmelein, what will county government look like in your mind or in your goals after, I believe it's two years now, it'll be a two-year term yes, correct. Uh, in office? So in other words, after two years, what's, what's, what's the county going to look like, county government? That's a very in-depth question. Uh, well, first of all, to start off the new year, we will have 19 legislators instead of tw the current 25. That's a, a big difference. The, uh, we will see more 
regionalization in the county through different efforts I think that are underway right now such as in the North County and around the lake there's some regional type things going on that I will elaborate on later um, other than that I would hope and, and this is where um, my opponent and I disagree is that I don't being firsthand I do not see the uh, the the uh, opposing forces Democrats, Republicans in, in the county that, that he epitomizes mm -hmm. or he, he <coughs> characterizes. I got along with several Democrats over the past few years. Uh, we, we don't always agree on everything, and, and, but uh, there's a lot of Republicans that, that don't agree with, with my point of view on some things. But uh, we have gotten along fairly well. Uh, but uh, I don't. Other than that, uh, I, I'm, I can't answer anymore. Okay. I will drop it. The, the question was really looking at what, what would be the services and the government as a whole, and you just have a little bit more time. Is yeah. there anything, any other thoughts on that? Well, I, I don't know as we can, uh, services, we, we're, we're, we've got to maintain our, our infrastructure and stuff like that for, mm -hmm. to maintain our services as a, as a vacation uh, mecca for, for visitors. But, uh, final look of government will hopefully through some of these regionalizations the the governments will get together finally and uh, start working together okay county and towns and stuff like that okay so. very good thank you okay same question mr. Curtis uh, what will county government look like after two years of you being in office okay well the first thing I'd like to uh, say is that uh, yes yeah, so there is some partisan politics up there because you can tell by the party line votes but uh, what I'd like to see is is uh, uh, a lean mean uh, government and that doesn't mean getting rid of people it means finding waste wherever you can find it uh, we need to create an environment in which people can find waste from the from the ground up uh, if you want to find waste and money that doesn't need to be spent ask your employees they know best uh, they, they will tell you and we need to create an environment where somebody can say something and not be shot down as, as if it is a criticism of the management but it, uh, embrace that as if uh, hey you're helping me uh, that's the first thing I'd like to do is create that environment where anybody can uh, say anything and you can give uh, pointers on how to save things now I know right up at the school there's things that I have mentioned before at one point we were uh, spending fourteen thousand dollars on fertilizer now this is not to criticize anybody at the school we have long care people come in and tell us but as with a farming background I looked at that and I said that's wasted money we're not feeding cows we're cutting it up and dropping it on the ground so we don't need to spend fourteen thousand dollars for fertilizer now <clears throat> if a person at the bottom of the the latter, so to speak, brings that to the administration, it needs to be looked at as uh, a good thing and not just poo-pooed and brushed away. There's a lot of those kind of things that go on. The other thing I'd like to see is, is we have a, a very concerted effort to keep these streams and lakes and all of our vacation things uh, in pristine condition. That's what brings people in here. And another thing that we need to do is we need to start educating our children for the jobs that are here and the job and for jobs that might come in. And that may mean more vocational training. It may be uh, some jobs that we haven't even thought of, but we need to find out what those are. If we trained all of our kids to do one thing, and then say, say that was uh, nursing, it might be really good for a hospital to move in, but it's not real good for a CNC uh, uh, industry that uses CNCs to move in. Uh, <clears throat> they like to, businesses need a skilled workforce. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Himmelin, if you'd like to respond. Uh, no, I, I, I will, or, add, or, my, or, I will or, add my remarks. Okay, well, you can, you can expand on your first answer if you like, or no, you can yeah. pass. I, you know, I, I, yeah, I, I, the infrastructure needs to be, in my, in my opinion, in many areas, and I see them firsthand, sitting on audit and control committee that many of those areas can and maybe should be reduced in our county government mm -hmm. uh, we worked very diligently 
on audit and control to do some of that work by reducing the county executive's proposed budget. So, you know, and which I will explain later, but uh, I, I do hope that uh, they can be downsized some. Okay, thank you. Mr. Crudis, you have one minute to respond. Uh, well, I guess when I think of infrastructure, I'm thinking of uh, industrial parks, uh, sewer systems, uh, roadways, and things like that. And uh, let's face it, business needs those things. Business needs good roads. Uh, they need sewer systems and, and uh, industrial parks. So to uh, reduce, I'm not sure very many towns, counties, or states have actually become wealthy by cutting. Uh, we need to have reasons for business to stay here. We can't increase taxes, we know that, because uh, comparatively we're taxed quite high. But we need to reduce waste and save money and, and make our infrastructure the best it can be with what we have. And that's what's going to bring business in mm -hmm. and bring residents in also. Uh, because business isn't going to come in if they don't have a skilled workforce, and the skilled work workforce isn't going to be here if there's no jobs. So we have to work on both. Okay, very good. Let's move on to question number two, which is related to, to the first question. And uh, I'll be directing this to Mr. Caruthers this time to start. Um, here's the question, it's a little bit long. Each year, the legislature attempts to, fu uh, to fund a variety of infrastructure capital projects. <coughs> However, there never seems to be enough money to cover the requested projects from the various departments. How do we not fall behind in maintaining our roads, bridges, buildings, and services. How could we change this to support infrastructure improvements? Mr. Cruz? Okay, thank you. Yeah, that is a lengthy question. <laughs> and it's a hard question also. Uh, you have to have priority list. And uh, some, some, uh, some things have a higher priority than others and, and you just have to face that fact. Uh, like I said, with our high tax, taxes here in this county, it's hard to say you're going to raise taxes. But on the other hand, there are some things if you don't do will just make the problem worse. If our roads deteriorate to the point where people don't want to come into our county, uh, we lose revenue. We have a, a, a sales tax that we get a lot of revenue from and we can't afford to lose that. So it, it, it's going to have to be based on a case by case scenario. You cannot just uh, blanket cover and we're going to reduce everything. And, and that's probably uh, you know, one of our problems uh, in government on all levels is what do you reduce and what do you increase? And it, it, you'll just have to take a hard look. If I wish I could sit here with a crystal ball and say this is the right thing to reduce and this is the right thing to increase, but I can't. Uh, uh, you have to have more detail and uh, you have to have a concerted effort. It, that's why we have a legislature is because we need a group of people to make these decisions and look at them. But we also need people to go out and find new ideas, do the footwork, because not everybody is going, doing the same footwork on the same thing. So what I would add to the legislature is, hey, I would be willing to look at those things. Uh, I'll, I will do the footwork. I am willing to do the hard work for this county to make it better. Okay, thank you. Uh, same question, Mr. Himmelin. <coughs> yes. Um, that is where I think I can excel a little bit in that I have sat on the audit control and, and looked at those things. And there is a board set up to look at capital projects from throughout the county that uh, different departments submit. And I'm quite happy to say that my home committee, the public facilities, did leave in an extra three hundred thousand dollars for road and bridge repairs this coming year that the county executive proposed we did not cut that so i am in the current other members of the current legislature are very mindful of uh, our infrastructure needs that they have to, you know the road especially roads and bridges that they have to be well maintained in order for people to come in and this county to be a, a, a visitor's mecca. Um, we have to also put a additional money, be it local or funding or grant funding, into some of our other projects that are going out there, like the equestrian trail, 
the, up near Silk, up near Cherry Creek. Uh, we have to maintain our snowmobile trails, our our hiking and, and and bike trails, and expand those. There are plans in the work to expand those to bring in more tourists. So, uh, you know, the you know we we are working. And I especially am working, and I did very carefully review all the capital projects out there. And uh, the board ranked them, and there was only a couple I had some differences with, and I brought them up in a meeting, but, but uh, they weren't enacted, but, uh, you know, that's, that's just the way it works. So, uh, yeah, that's it. Okay, thank you. Mr. Crudis, response to this, or expansion of your answer? <coughs> uh, not really a response. I, I just want to reiterate some of the things I said is that, uh, yes, there has to be a priority list and uh, uh, people have to do footwork on these things and, and uh, actually sell them to the legislature. Uh, let's face it, the, every legislative member is not going to go out and do the footwork for one thing. So we need people that can come to the legislature uh, with the facts and with the ideas and sell it to them so that they uh, can work on it. Uh, just bringing an idea in isn't enough. You have to be able to sell it to them and, and try to make it work. And there's going to be failures. And uh, people have to be willing to accept those failures. Uh, and when I say failures, it's probably not one of those type of failures where you crash your car, but it's more of a failure as it didn't work out quite the way you wanted. It doesn't mean it's a complete failure. But we have to be willing to accept that kind of thing. Uh, and we also have to be uh, eager enough to get in there and sell it if it's a good idea. Because just just posting an idea isn't enough. You have to have the facts and uh, the salesmanship to get it through. Thank you, and Mr. Himmeling, if you want. Yeah, to and, and just to just to expand on that. Yeah, mm -hmm. that is what the planning board does. There's the whole application process and the individual uh, department heads that that uh, are requesting these funds from the capital project fund uh, come in and do a presentation to the planning board as well as they have all. all a long uh, <coughs> list of questions that they have to provide answers for. So, and those are all rated. And it's this rating system that the board uses that determines which is the, gets the highest priority for things getting done. Uh, one thing that's been on the back burner for a few years is a new building down for the highway department down in Falconer. Uh, their old building is uh, really unsafe to use, quite honestly. So we're looking currently right now at uh, looking at uh, like three and a half or four million dollars, whichever the engineers come up with, the architects come up with, as uh, a new building down there. Uh, infrastructure, uh, we got a grant, six million dollar grant, the sheriff did on his part, to buy new radios, whole new radio system for the county, for the fire and police, that's going to greatly enhance their safety. <coughs> So there are capital projects out there, and, and some of them are fairly large, that, that are being done today. Okay, thank you very much. All right, I'd like to now move on to a different topic and two new questions. Um, if anyone watches the senior report, you will know that uh, the topic of the county home has been near and dear to all of our hearts, and we have covered it from day one. I've uh, personally been attending meetings and so forth, and tracking this particular topic. And so here's the question, and we'll begin with Mr. Himmeline this yes. time. If the home were sold, and it, we, day by day, you're never quite sure, would you support pilots, payment in lieu of taxes, for investors to open the way for more senior, independent living and assisted living units um, throughout the county as the baby boomer generation retires and will fill up the limited services that are presently available? This is for the county home. And yes, this is for all other nursing homes too to expand pilot program to expand there for the investors of whoever buys the county home. Oh, for, specifically for the county home. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, we, we met with the with the <coughs> potential purchasers uh, buyers of the of the county home the other night in the legislature uh, on the on the ninth, and uh, they. It was their intention, when and if and when they get some money, that they will probably expand on the 30 acres down there in Dunkirk. They will, they will expand uh, their 
care, their, their physical therapy, as well as their assisted living spit capacity down there. So if it takes a pilot to get that in place, and depending on the terms of the, of the pilot, of course, you know, you, 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 the pilots can go from, from just a sales tax exemption to a, a full-blown, uh, you know, 50% property tax exemption. Uh, depending on how much that is, I would definitely be supportive of that, yes, because I think that the, the county home should be sold. I think that at one time there was a place for the county home, uh, for the people in the county home, the poor, the indigent, but with the uh, advent of Medicaid and Medicare, uh, that is the safety net for these senior citizens. And uh, I think that we need to, the county needs to get out of doing what the private industry can do as well or better than. Okay, uh, thank you. Same question, Mr. Cruz. Uh, yeah, I'd have to agree, agree with Dave on uh, some of his points as far as uh, giving a tax break for that. But I, I, I would have some reservations because, let's face it, uh, once you start in privatizing it, and which it looks like it is going to be sold, uh, the problem is, is, you know, how fair is that for other businesses? You know, if you're in business doing something, it doesn't matter whether it's a nursing home or anything, uh, and one nursing home is getting a tax break and you've been in business for a long time and you're not getting it, it's kind of unfair business practice. So I guess it would be on a case by case. Uh, and, and again, like what Dave said is, is how much and what is it? So it's a hard question to answer. Uh, but these nursing homes are going to be in great demand in the next few years. Uh, and they will have to expand, I would guess. Now, one problem with, with the expansion is getting these licenses. So if you have a license, uh, it's very valuable, and uh, uh, that, that may be a problem in the future, getting licenses. And I don't know how the state is going to handle that. So I guess that's another subject, so I'm, I'm kind of getting off topic. So thank you. Okay. Uh, back to you, Mr. Himline, for any other thoughts on this topic? Yes. Uh no, I just lost my thought. <laughs> <laughs> um, everything is not always fair when you are working out there in the private industry out there. So if we give a, pi a pilot to a company that's coming into the, the county and is going to either keep the jobs or give the community more jobs, then I'm, I am for it. Uh, Yes, it isn't always fair to the established industry, but uh, if, if it means more people employed, better jobs, then, then I am for it. Okay. Um, Mr. Cruz. Uh, well, I'd just like to say that there are some businesses that come into the county, are, they're going to come in regardless. And uh, if nursing homes make money, they're going to be here. And you won't have to give them money to come in. Now, if nursing homes don't make money, they're not going to be here anyway. Now, there are, there are uh, situations where you do have to bring people, you know, give them the pilot or sales tax abatement. I, I agree. But if you're just going to do it uh, to do it, then it doesn't make sense. If, if they're going to make money and they're going to come in, we have a lot of people that need to go there. Well, then maybe it doesn't need to be done. But that may take a lot of research to, to figure that out. Okay. Obviously, it's a very complicated uh, matter, and uh, we certainly have studied it here at the Senior Report. But I want to make it even more complicated. We know that um, there are people that would like to save the home, that people want to sell the home, they want to expand the home, people say we can't expand the home. And the question for Mr. Crudis is, why can't state laws be changed to allow the county to be on the same playing field as the privately owned facilities? What can you do as a legislator to make the difference? Uh, yes. Why can't they be? Well, probably because of lobbyists. Uh, and I'm not going to, that, that's the one word that's really not in my vocabulary. Can't, they can be. I'm sure they could be. Uh, almost anything can be done if you really put your mind to it. And sometimes maybe they should be because, uh, you know, we have a lot of cases of medicated uh, fraud and patient abuse in the private uh, homes. And that's not to say all of them are. I'm not against private homes whatsoever. But the laws could be changed. Now, <clears throat> 
uh, as a legislator, I would be in contact with Andy Goodell, Kathy Young, and, and the like, and, and I know those people anyway. And that would be one of the things that, that I might uh, work at, just to, uh, to make sure that uh, things can be done like that. Uh, same way with our education of our young people. I'd like to uh, lobby for some th changes there also. And uh, uh, that, that just gets right down to the, one of the, the, my pet peeves is that word can't. And when you said that, that, that set me off there because <laughs> I, really, I really don't have that. My, uh, the way my father raised me is, is, is uh, if I said the word can't, he said, well, you will. <laughs> and uh, that's the way I've lived my life. I've, uh, anything mm -hmm. I've decided to do, I've been able to do. And so I, I guess uh, I just don't agree with the question. It, it can be done if you work hard enough. All right, uh, Mr. Himmeling, your turn. Yes. Can't was never allowed in, <laughs> in my house either. Oh, we were raised the same. <laughs> the farmers. So we have that. In yeah, it was farmers. Yeah, we have absolutely. That in we Thank we you, could Dave. not could not say can't. Uh, but I, and, and, and here, I, you know, I've got to agree with Ed a little bit, is that, uh, believe it or not, <laughs> but uh, I, I can't. Uh, Commonality. <laughs> yeah, we can get along, see. Um, yeah, we can. No, that, uh, where was I going? It uh, doesn't help to, uh, you know. Well, the state, the state says you you're not allowed to expand. Yeah, and, 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 and you can't. I, I carry no illusion to the fact that we can ask, and we can ask as a body, we can ask as individually to our, our senators and legislators. <clears throat> but sometimes, like we've tried to do other things in the past, we've sent resolutions to, to the legislators and stuff, and it falls on deaf ears. So I have no illusion that these laws will ever get changed. I can ask and I can ask, but uh, I doubt seriously if the state will ever allow us to run a county home any different than, than what it is right now. Okay, thank you. There may be other things that pop up where the state holds us hostage to the to rules and regulations. So Mr. Akrutis, you have an opportunity to expand on the county home or just the state in general? <clears throat> Well, <laughs> part of our problem is lobbyists. It, it really is. Uh, the law for uh, non-expansion of county homes, that was brought on by lobbyists. And uh, we need to get that out of our politics. We need to stop electing people that are held hostage by lobbyists and special interest groups. Uh, and, you know, we're all, we're all members of special interest groups. But we ha what we have to do is remember that just because I want it doesn't mean we can take from another group and, and uh, give it to yourself. Uh, so as far as uh, changing those laws, that is a big obstacle, lobbyist, I believe. And uh, uh, it's just one of those things you have to work at to get those things changed. They can be changed. Uh, uh, we, you know, we can hunt with rifles now. We, for how many years could we not hunt with rifles in Chautauqua County and all of a sudden it changed? So you have to, it takes work, it takes a lot of hard work, and uh, it takes uh, the public knowing and speaking out. And uh, if you look right now, you see Scope has a, uh, a big campaign out to repeal the SAFE Act. And uh, they are speaking out and they're organizing. And that, that's the kind of thing that has to happen to change these laws so that uh, our, our representatives take notice. And I, I know at the state level it's hard because so many of those representatives are uh, from downstate and that really is it downstate or upstate? <laughs> uh, but that, but that, you know, they carry a lot of weight down there, and they don't understand how we live here, and and they need to be made to understand how we live up here, so they can understand our problems. Okay, thank you. <coughs> hey, Mr. Himmeling. Mandates. What's that? Mandates. Mandates. Oh, oh I hate okay. that word. <laughs> I definitely Camp hate and mandates. that word. <laughs> yes, uh, I see them every day from the Department of Health and Human Services mandates that. The, control more than 50 percent 50 million dollars of our local share of taxes uh to like ed said the the safe act um i don't agree with the way the state has run our county tried to even though you know we are are supposed to be self-governing that doesn't really happen too much, only on some very local matters. But uh, it doesn't appear that uh, we'll ever get rid of mandates. Uh, 
there are too many people in Albany, Washington, that have their own agendas that are forcing them down onto the local people. And I just don't see that going away, even though the governor has appointed a, a, a couple of new boards uh, at the state level to, to look at some of this stuff. But, uh, you know, mandates are here for, for forever. <laughs> okay, and I, I know about mandates from my own career in education, so yes. it makes you wonder. Okay, if we can move on. We're about halfway through our topics, guys. We're doing a great okay, job, okay? okay. I uh, hope you're, you're <clears throat> comfortable, and I hope you all yeah. are enjoying the debate so far today. Uh, if you just join us, I'm Doc Hamels, and uh, we are having a debate for uh, County Legislature of District 18, which covers Minot, Finley Lake, Sherman, Chautauqua, Mayville, and DeWittville. I don't know if it's DeWittville or DeWittville. Uh, it depends on who you talk to. Yes. Okay, gentlemen, the next topic that we're going to talk about is water and sewer districts in Chautauqua County Lakes. The question, we're going to start with uh, Mr. Himmeline this time. Water and sewer are key infrastructures for county growth. What is your vision for the county? Who is going to pay for this? Without this uh, infrastructure, there's no economic growth. How do you cope with this as a legislature? Well, uh, there is a lot going on as far as, as water and sewer districts. Uh, a plan is, is being developed, or has been recently developed, to extend a sewer district clear around Chautauqua Lake. Um, that is going to be very, very expensive. And quite honestly, it will be a district just like the, the South County, you know, Lake District and the, the North County and the Portland Pomfret Sewer District. Um, it's going to be paid by those taxpayers. Um, it isn't something that's going to be passed on to somebody that lives over in Mina to support the, uh, the uh, building of the sewer around Chautauqua Lake. But by the same token, the people around Chautauqua Lake, because Mina Finley Lake is looking at currently building a sewer district around my lake and I know that they're looking at very large numbers, uh, very, very large, 18 million or, or better, just to go around Finley Lake. So, and that will be borne <coughs> by the, the taxpayers around the lake. Um, do I like it? No. Uh, is it, because right now, uh, there is very little grants out there that I know of or have heard of to help with that infrastructure. Um, but uh, it is important either through the building of those sewer districts or more enforced septic systems uh, to manage the weeds and, and, the, and the stuff that uh, nutrients that go into all of our lakes. Uh, you know, we've got to keep our lakes clean for, to draw in visitors. Uh, if we don't do that, then, then we've lost a ball game because tourism is a, is a huge factor to our economy in, in this county. Okay, thank you. Mr. Krutus, your turn. Yeah, well, this is one time I have to agree with Dave. Actually, it's not the one time. We've agreed a yeah. lot. But, uh, yes, we have to have this. And uh, sorry for the people who live around the lake. It's going to have to be paid for by tax money, uh, which is your money. Uh, the septic systems that you could put in around the lake in place of a sewer system would probably be more uh, expensive than putting the sewer system in. So that's really not an option there. Having put in a few septic systems, I, I know the, the space that is needed is just not there when you're living around the lake. So the, the sewer system is a must because, let's face it, that's our economy. Our number one economy now is tourism, and uh, we can't afford to screw it up. Uh, I've been on that lake, uh, Chautauqua, a few times when you couldn't even drive a boat in some places because of the weeds. And weeds like fertilizer, and sewage is fertilizer to weeds. So we have to, we have to limit that as much as possible, and along with other things, you know, uh, over-fertilizing yards and, and uh, farm runoff is also a problem. But, uh, uh, you know, you just can't have a septic system running into the lake. Uh, it's, just not going to fly in this day and age and and that's one of the costs of living in a modern society okay mr. Himmeline expansion of your 
your first question or answer or any thoughts? No, uh, uh, in addition to what I said before, um, I know that the, the, the townships surrounding Chautauqua Lake all signed an agreement to limit or try to limit the runoffs from their townships into the lake and therefore, you know, greatly reducing, you know, sediment and nutrients going into the lake. So that in itself, as well as the farmers out there that are in these watersheds, they do realize what is happening to the lake and they are willing to help the ones that I've talked to to try and keep some of those nutrients out of the out of the lake so that the weeds and stuff do not grow. But uh, you know, right now Chautauqua Lake, it, it, there's, uh, I talked with another legislator and they're trying to form a, an umbrella organization to encompass the smaller organizations that have anything to do with Chautauqua Lake and, and so that they can make better use of the funds and, and have a, a more common goal to, to make the lake better. So. Okay, thank you. Mr. Curtis, your opportunity? Uh, no, I mean, I think we agree uh, uh, wholeheartedly on uh, the lake. Uh, just, just to add a few things is uh, some of the things that are happening to the lake are natural part of a lake. Uh, runoff from uh, fields or woods or whatever it is flows into the lake, you get sediments, and it's not just fertilizers, it's not just sewage, it's not just phosphates from uh, soap, it's also just sediments, natural sediments that come from the woods or anywhere else. And so part of it we can't do anything about. We can only try to minimize it and extend the life of our lakes because the natural part of a lake is eventually to fill in. I'm sure we're a few hundred years away from that at Lake Chautauqua, but we want to extend it as long as we can by doing everything we can. Okay, this next question is similar to some of your responses, but maybe we can expand a little bit on it. We constantly hear from out-of-town folks how beautiful our lakes are, whether it's Chautauqua, Casadega, Finley Lake, and so forth. The lakes continue to be a football tossed around as to whose responsibility it is to maintain. And Mr. Himmelin, you started to allude to uh, this committee, but we know that one time it's the state's responsibility and it's the county's responsibility, and it just seems like nobody is really grabbing the ball, and it's, it's, it's a mystery to us. So with limited resources, as a legislator now, what's your plan to revitalize the lake? And you've touched on it a little bit, maybe you can expand, clean up the sewer issues, but one area that we haven't talked about is good water to all our residents, good drinking water, cooking water. I mean, how many times do we hear that people say they have to buy bottled water and so forth? So we'll start with Mr. Carutis this time. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the, what the question is. Would you all right, well, what we want to hear is more about um, whose responsibility is the lake Okay. and how are we going to get good water and maybe you can expand more about sewer and so forth throughout the whole county. You know? Right, right. Well, uh, I guess uh, when you have a lake in your county, it's your responsibility. Now, whether you get help from the state whenever you can, that's, that, you know, that's all good. Try to get as much as you can. Because let's face it, our environment is everybody's responsibility. You can't just pin it on our county. But it is in our county, so we have to take the, the, the bulk of the responsibility. But when it comes to natural resources, I think you know, everybody is responsible for all of our natural resources. So that's the first thing. We, we take the first responsibility. But we get help from the state or even the federal government if there's grants out there for that. Because, like I said, natural resources are, is everybody's responsibility. But as far as getting uh, water, I mean, uh, there's, there's plenty of ways to get water. And I guess uh, I couldn't be, I, I guess I'm not up on this subject as far as, as our infrastructure for water uh, in this county is, is, is to what we need to do. Uh, I'm not sure just what needs to be done. So I guess I'll have to uh, uh, plead uh, fifth on this. <laughs> but I mean, you know, there's, uh, I will say one thing, is I have a good background in, uh, in, in farming and a lot of different things. I think I can make a good judgment as to what needs to be done if, if we want clean water. I mean, there's a lot of uh, self-purification systems for houses. Uh, if you want uh, city water, I mean, we, we, know what need, we know how to get water to people. It's just a question of whether we have the money for it. 
I guess that would probably be a top priority in most people's book as to whether they had clean water. So it's kind of a no-brainer as to whether you're going to have clean water or not. <coughs> okay, thank you. And now to you, Mr. Himalayan. Yes. Who owns the lake? I, I don't that's know. A, that's a question that's been <laughs> bounced like, around you tell for a us, long please? time. <laughs> uh, I will say this, though, that uh, if it were strictly the counties, the county would not have to ask the DEC permission to do anything on the lake, just like over in Finley. Uh, Finley does really, Finley Lake, the Watershed Foundation does not own the lake. If they want to do anything to the lake, a, a dock being built into the lake or anything like that, you got to get DEC approval. So if I got to get somebody's approval, I would say that they probably own it. Um, you know, and as far as water, yeah, everybody should have and is entitled to clean water. Now, I know that the, the village here has their own water system. Um, Sherman has their own water system. Mine is totally on wells, mm -hmm. as well as, you know, everybody else out in the countryside is on wells. Uh, we have good water, hard water. It's not like down along the lake shore that's got sulfur. <laughs> <laughs> which I'm sure you're familiar with. But uh, to combat some of that, you know, Chadwick Bay Water District is just getting formed that's going to encompass Sheridan and uh, Dunkirk, Fredonia, up there. and yeah, up in Hanford, Hanover, you know, area too. <coughs> and, and that will give that whole area, not only will it give it of, is it a form of regionalization, which I, you know, I, is, is wonderful that we've got everybody to work together, but it will also give you know, everybody in that area good, clean water to drink. Now, it's just like putting in a sewer system around you know, in this area. You know, it's going to cost a whole lot of money. So the, you know, none of this stuff comes cheap. So if uh, we decide or it is decided to put a, a district or water in, and around why a district is going to have to be formed, regional district, and uh, just like everything else, and the, the taxpayers would then, then have to pay for it. Okay, thank you. Ms. Carutis, expansion of your answer or thoughts? Uh, well, I really don't have much to expand on. Like I said, I don't know the ins and outs of every town's water system. I mean, I know what Dave does. Sherman has their own water system, and the countryside has wells. But I mean, water is important. We have to make sure we have clean water. Uh, uh, let's face it, uh, people moving in or buying a summer home, if they can't get clean water, they're not going to buy that summer home. Or they're not going to vacation here if they can't drink the water. Uh, so it's, it's one of those things that has to be a priority. Just like I said earlier uh, today is you have to set priorities that are going to help you. You have to set priorities that are uh, uh, going to benefit everyone or even individuals in some cases. So um, that's where I stand on that. It's a priority, no doubt. Okay, thank you. All right, gentlemen, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit, give you a chance to get a drink of water. Folks, if you're just joining us, I'm Dr. John Hamels. I'm the moderator of today's debate. We are d talking about a variety of topics. We've talked about the future of county government, the county home, uh, water and, and sewer districts in the, in the lakes and so forth, where these gentlemen are, are, are being, their brains are being picked apart. Um, we have an opportunity for you as the viewer to call, and as you can see on the screen, if you want to call us at 753-5225, uh, we have someone to answer calls. There are going to be screening calls, and uh, we have one more big topic and a couple questions we're going to ask, and hopefully we're going to have some questions from you, the, the viewers. I've heard the phone ring in the background, so I know people are calling in. Uh, if you're watching the show, we're live right now, uh, Saturday, whatever it is, October, what's today's date? 12th. 12th. I don't know, I'm lost. The 12th. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. I got my little earpiece. And uh, you may be seeing this later in the week, so you can't call in. It's only today on Saturday, uh, October 12th. All right, we're, we're, we're gaining here as, as we go along, so please call in your questions. All right, gentlemen, we're going to start with uh, Mr. Himmeline again uh, on this question. This is a doozy, so prepare yourselves. <laughs> All right, here we go. The topic is taxes, employment, and the economy. The first question under this, here we go. And again, these questions come a lot from our show and our, and our folks here at the, the Senior Report. We are heavily taxed. 
Reed Powers will tell you that we're the most taxed uh, county for its size in the country. Mm -hmm. We have streamlined government. We have less, we have less departments, we have, we've merged them and so forth. We've cut costs, we know that. You, you, you guys just talked about, you cut the budget the other day. We're told that we need to sell our county programs, such as the county home and airports. But tell us, how does this all translate into jobs and a thriving economy, or is this the wrong approach? So Mr. Hemline, you may begin. I don't <laughs> think that that approach will solve our whole economic dilemma that, that this county faces. Um, once again, or especially this year, here again sitting on audit and control, um, we were able to cut taxes this year from the county executive's proposed budget. Uh, his, he had a 24 cent increase in, in full value rate and the, as of the other day, 11 o'clock uh, Wednesday, we had reduced that to a five cent decrease in full value rate for the taxpayers. So, you know, uh, if that goes through, then, then every taxpayer in the county can expect a, a small decrease in their tax bill. Um, reducing taxes alone will not drive the, anybody's economy. It takes a joint effort between private and public to build an economy. And until, and, and a pilot program is one way that the county can participate and, and help private industry gain employment. But the county alone can't increase employment. It has to work with and through private industry. So uh, I don't, uh, I hope we can see more and more of that. Uh, we have the IDA out there. Uh, we have to <coughs> get them working very hard to build our economy. Thank you. Mr. Crudus, your opportunity. Well, yes, uh, one of the reasons we're heavily taxed is because we're a shrinking economy. If we, weren't a sh if we were a growing economy, we probably wouldn't be as heavily taxed. If you look around the country and you see a growing economy, you're going to see people that are not heavily taxed because there's construction jobs and uh, there's businesses moving in that pay taxes. Uh, so that's, that's some of the stuff we have to do. Now, I know we're not going to turn this county around and all of a sudden have a boom town here. Uh, I'm not, you know, completely living in a wonderland <laughs> but <laughs> but I do believe there's some things that we can do to at least stop the shrinkage we need to stop it so that we can live a life that everybody else lives there's so there's a couple things that need to be done now we know right now we're, we're heavily mandated on a lot of things we're different than New York City we don't need some of the mandates that are out there some of the mandates that uh, are out there cost us money but we're, we don't really need those mandates uh, so maybe we could do uh, Maybe, maybe our, we could lobby to get some of those mandates lifted for our county. I mean, we do it for hunting. At one time, you could hunt with a shotgun in Chautauqua County and only a shotgun. In uh, other counties, you could hunt with a rifle. So why can't we have some of the mandates here, for example, just with our schools? Uh, we cannot merge a school that is not contiguous with another school. And we can't have a regional high school. Well, maybe those mandates or those laws are good for some areas. But in our area, it may not be good and they need to be lifted. So maybe our, our, our state representatives need to be enlightened a little bit and changed. The other thing is, is we need to have an educated workforce for our area. Now, I know the governor wants everyone college ready and that's great, but we don't have jobs for all those in our county. All those students who come out of college with $30,000 worth of debt and a degree in communications or some other thing, there's just not enough jobs here for those people. But we do have jobs for welders, CNC operators, uh, carpenters, plumbers, and probably a, a whole list of jobs that I can't even think of, technical jobs, skilled labor jobs. Uh, so if you had a, a workforce 
coming out of our schools, and I'm not talking just high schools, but I, I do believe high schools could be changed, but JCC and JCC has started a great welding program up there in uh, manufacturing, uh, manufacturing uh, uh, degrees, uh, and we need more of it. But if we had a workforce, a skilled workforce coming out with those kind of people, it might be a little easier to get a manufacturing company to move in or some other kind of company. Now I have a nephew that uh, graduated from JCC, their welding program, great program. He went to Alfred, JCC started their program up and thank you legislator for, uh, for uh, funding that. Uh, came out of there, had a job before he left and he has a mm -hmm. great job. I believe he's making more money than I am up to the school uh, and we need more of that. Okay. And, Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> we, we found a talking near and dear to your heart. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I don't mean to cut you off, but we need yeah. to stick to okay. our program here. Okay, you, Mr. 10 second warning. <laughs> <next time. laughs> uh, okay, and I believe, where, where are we here? Mr. Himmelin, you have the opportunity to rebut. Yeah, when Mr. Carudas started off, he almost sounded like a Republican. <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, you but, funding that program actually sounded like a Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, tip for tat. Anyway, uh, no, uh, there's no doubt that we have to match for the economy in this county to grow. We have to match our skills with our workforce with the jobs needed. And from the way I understand it right now, even with what we've done there with, with in, some, in the technical schools down there at, uh, at James, JCC, uh, it isn't enough to fill the void. Um, I heard a report, and I haven't had time to check into it, but I have heard that in the north part of the county that there is an agency that's looking for over a thousand workers, but can't find them because they're not don't have the job skills to fill the jobs so uh, we have to do a better job of training those people and there's got to be people that want to be trained uh, you know and, and that goes back to some of the mandates that the state has sent down that has made it too easy for people to be on social services and not get off because they're so uh, they've been expanded so much that they they don't want to learn a job, but we've we've got to break that cycle, get them out there, get them uh, le learning a skill, so that uh, we can fill the jobs and grow the economy. Okay, thank you. Now, Mr. Cruz, you can continue on your answer. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I I may have already said it. I forgot what I said. No. <laughs> <laughs> so if I say something completely different, let me know. No, uh, we need. We, it needs to start with our 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 teenage kids, the ones coming out of school. We need to create an environment in which it's okay to go to be a welder. It's okay to go learn CNC operations because, uh, like Dave said, you know we need those skilled workers. We have a company that wants them, and we don't have them. But the problem is, is it should have been done already. This should already be in place. We should already have them. We were working in the wrong direction. We need to change it. Okay, thank you. All right, um, the last prepared question we have uh, is going to continue on this theme. And uh, the way it's written, it says, it's a question of the chicken and the egg, which came first? <laughs> and so in the county, you see a lot of finger pointing. You see people saying, well, you guys aren't doing this, and the others are saying you didn't do that. And so it, it, this is a little bit expansion of the, of the last question. Did in, industry, <clears throat> excuse me, did industry leave Chautauqua County causing our taxes to increase uh, due to the eroding tax base, or did increasing taxes cause industry to move away? And we'll start with Mr. Karudis. So which is it in your mind? What, what happened and, you know, why? Well. Uh, a lot of things happened. Uh, China happened. Japan happened back in the 70s. Uh, high oil prices happened at different times. Uh, different times it was lower, different times it was higher. Also, uh, uh, if you look at states that have a low tax rate, uh, such as Texas and Alaska, they have huge supplies of oil coming out of the ground to offset uh, income tax and things like that. So that also happens. So we have a lot of things working uh, against us, so to speak. And then there's also uh, different things, for example, in the farming industry. Uh, if you go out west, uh, some places have three, four feet of top dirt and uh, no snow. 
So now our farmers here have to compete with that. So there's, there's a whole list of factors uh, that have caused this. Uh, when when uh, I was in uh, high school, I, I was told that it was unions. Well, the unions left. We have very few unionized workers, and the jobs are still leaving. So we can't blame it on them anymore. Uh, it, 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 it's just the, the mobility of everybody. It's a competitive society, and you have to have something here to uh, keep people here and draw people here. And it can't all be, it can't all come from income taxes, giving money to the industry to bring them here because that's a short-term fix. You need long-term fixes. And you need, uh, we, uh, I'll go back to the education. We need, we need these skilled workers. At, at least that's one thing that will keep our kids here and it may draw business in. Uh, as far as the chicken and the egg, uh, I think it was a whole list of things that happened and the businesses left. When the businesses started leaving, the taxes started going up and uh, one just fed off the other. Uh, but, you know, that's water over the dam. Uh, we can't do that now. We, we're on a trend. We have to change that trend right now. We have to do whatever we can. And I really believe it is uh, one, one aspect is to get those skilled workers trained. And they're going to be, they're going to be college or high school graduates. They're not going to be people in their 40s on disability. Uh, uh, they're, they're hard to change. But we need those high school kids to stay here and start paying taxes. And uh, that, that's my view on that. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, Mr. Himmelin, your opportunity now. Yes, I, I, I do, do believe that uh, a lot of the industry that has fled this county, and, and I say fled, they've left, uh, is due to a combination of not finding a, uh, the right workforce, uh, not, and well, as well as high taxes and, and that high taxes isn't just a even though people are say they argue which which one are we we're the fourth highest county in, in the nation as far as taxes go but it that's ir irrelevant uh, we are one of the highest uh, but a lot of that is caused because of mandates sent down by the state as well as the the state's own high amount of debt that they carry that they have to keep their taxes high to to pay off some of that debt even though that may not happen in my lifetime uh, them paying off the debt but uh, you know that's what they they say they're doing um, but yeah it's gonna take uh, a lot of effort to keep those jobs back in the county retraining is a big thing uh, they've people they've just left because of the, of the high taxes in my opinion Okay, thank you. Um, in the paper, you hear um, the IDA doing this, the IDA, IDA doing that. Um, as far as the county executive candidates, you know, one supports the situation, the other one seems to be down on it. So maybe in, in a follow-up on this, can do you have any thoughts about the IDA, how they've been doing, and maybe the direction they would go? And Mr. Carutis. Uh Well, you know, uh, I can't say a lot about the IDA, but I can say uh, a few things. There, there are some businesses that are going to be here regardless of the IDA. They just are. For example, a mo hotel is not going to move into Chautauqua County unless it's needed. Hotels, I happen to know of uh, an owner of a hotel, and it, it's a fairly profitable business. And you don't need to be full all the time. You, matter of fact, you don't even need to be half full to make money in a hotel. So that leaves, you know, 50% of your rooms are open most of the time. But you don't, there are just some businesses that don't need the IDA. And I think the IDA supports some businesses they don't need to support. I don't think they're quite critical enough. I think they're scared not to, uh, to, to help them. You know, they're afraid that they won't get this. But if you don't get a hotel that you don't need, well, that, that's you know that's, that's a moot point there. Uh, if you get a hotel and you don't need it, and another one goes out, what did you gain? So uh, that's my that's my take on the IDA. I think they just need a little oversight. Uh, we we have to have some sort of uh, commission to draw business in, or or at least be a uh, a negotiator between business and government and try to get these in. But uh, I'm not sure that, uh, I mean, you've heard about Buffalo's IDA. They have had their problems also, you know, as far as funding things that really don't need to be funded. Uh, now, if you want to bring in a manufacturing business, 
you know, and you can get the IDA to uh, give them a little boost to come in here. Uh, those are the kind of things I'd like to see, uh, manufacturing and things like that. Now, if you're, if you're talking about a new restaurant, well, quite frankly, if we need a restaurant, somebody's going to build one. And they're going to build it whether the IDA helps them or not because they're going to make money. And if they're not going to make money, they probably better not build it because the IDA isn't going to make them profitable just by giving them a little boost. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Himmelin. The manifesto that the, that the IDA works under is to retain jobs and create jobs. And, and that's what they're supposed to do. Uh, so, and they, I, I know from firsthand experience that it, they do work quite hard at doing that. But you also have to remember that uh, some of these places have chosen to move out no matter what we can afford to give them as a county and even as a state because there are other economic development agencies in other states that are given more because their economy is a little bit higher and, and they're thriving more. So we're out there competing against you know South Carolina, Texas, you know, Mexico, all of those places that uh, with our formula for, for taxes, we, we just can't equal. Uh, and, and in some cases, the infrastructure, like we were talking about before, the sewer and the water districts aren't there that these, some of these industries want. Okay, and thank you. Okay, catch your breath a little bit. We have only about 22 minutes left. It's been flying, hasn't it? Oh, and it's gone. And I do appreciate your, your uh, willingness to, to, to speak with us today. Um, at this point in time, we do have someone that has called in. So we're going to try to pipe that, that caller into the, the studio here. And uh, I, I'm going to assume Chris and Jeff, we're ready to hear from this uh, caller and the question. How okay. So let's have, let's have a listen. How can we balance the financial and environmental impact on our roads, lakes, bridges, recycling, and water and sewage systems? Does the income generated by tourism exceed the costs? Okay, let me reiterate that one since I yes. have it printed That's, here. The, okay. I, I, in my earpiece, it sounded a little garbly, yes. so uh, let's, let's, this was the caller's question. How can we balance the financial and environmental impact on our roads lakes, bridges, recycling in water, it's a long one, or sewage systems, does the income generated by tourism exceed the cost? I guess so they're, they're talking about how, you know, tourism versus all the improvements that are needed. And um, so we'll start with Mr. Himalayan. Well, I, I think that's almost the, the, the chicken and egg, egg thing again. Uh, you know, if you don't have the infrastructure out there, the roads, the bridges, the sewer systems to bring people into the county that want, want to live here mm -hmm. or recreate here. Uh, you need that in, in infrastructure first to uh, you know, draw them here. Um, I, and quite honestly, I don't know if there has been a comparison does what we spend on, on the infrastructures uh, equate or is less than uh, you know what we bring in, in in tourism dollars I cannot answer that um, I don't know I have not done a comparison that way okay it sounds like the caller is questioning whether we should be putting our money into tourism we get a good bang for our dollar I don't yeah. know the answer either okay Mr. Curtis what's your uh, uh, thoughts yeah, on that? Uh, yeah it's a very good question because sometimes we don't think out of the box like that uh, sometimes we don't we just see all this money coming in and then we say well we have to spend money to keep it so it's a very valid question I think but on the other hand too is some of the things we have to do anyway as far as our uh, sewer system I mean you know we we don't want open sewers and things like that so we we need to, to have some of those things anyway uh, but as far as the extra things that we may do uh, you know it, it could be a valid point uh, like I guess I have to agree with Dave there's you know I don't think anybody's done a study it would take a little bit of uh, number crunching to figure that out quite a little bit actually and sometimes we don't think what would happen if we didn't uh, matter of fact I was talking to a person in Sherman of all places who said well what if the what if we let the farm you know right now the farms get a tax exemption on their land and that helps keep them in business in Sherman Clymer and Finley mm -hmm. uh, 
And he said, well, what if we didn't give it to them? And what if some of them went out? What would happen? You know, I mean, I, it, believe me, farming is very dear to me, and I support farmers 100%. But what if, what if some of them went out of business that were on the poorer land? We've had that happen in the past, and part of that did help shrink our economy. But with this environment right now, if, you, if you've looked around, you see hunting cabin after hunting cabin. If, if uh, some of those went out, possibly we would make more money on, as far as revenue, tax revenue, on hunting cabins than we would farmers. Uh, you know, it's one of those things that nobody ever thinks about. They just say, well, let's just keep the farmers in business, keep them in business. But, you know, sometimes you have to let supply and demand and, uh, and the free market take over. And sometimes you get the results that you never thought of would happen. Okay. Talking about anticipated results. Unanticipated. Yeah, unanticipated right. results, exactly. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Himmelin, your thoughts back on that? Yeah, I... I Believe it or not, Ed, I have to kind of agree with you that uh, the infrastructures out there, sewer, water, roads, bridges, they have to main, be maintained for our, our local citizens to get back and forth to their jobs, for the, the economy as it exists today to, to still maintain itself, sustain itself. So uh, yeah, we, we need that infrastructure out there. Um, how are we going to pay for this? I know that uh, just recently uh, through the Audit and Control Committee, I know that uh, the bed tax that exists out there, 5% bed tax, that does go to support our lakes and, and tourism, and, which brings in, in, in people. But the uh, finance department just got through sending out letters and, and enforcing the bed tax receipts, uh, receipts of uh, bed tax money, and in the last few months, they've taken in an, an additional two hundred thousand dollars that we did not have before, and uh, so that is helping to pay for that infrastructure. Okay, and Mr. Curtis, your thoughts? Um, no, I guess I don't really have a, a whole lot more. Uh, uh, the bed tax, uh, two hundred thousand dollars, is. Not small change, but in a uh, two hundred million dollar budget, it's not very much either. So, I guess it's one of those things that uh, the number crunching would probably tell the story. And even then, that probably wouldn't even be an exact because of all those unknowns of what might happen if if we didn't have the tourism. Uh, un unanticipated consequences are, are at every corner on, on that question. <laughs> okay, folks. Well, then let, we can uh, move on to our next call-in question. I have it written here, and I'll, I'll read it to you. Um, if you just join us, we're in the, the, the last throes of this debate for county legislator for District 18. We've got Mr. David Himmeline and Mr. Ed Karudis, and I'm Doc Hamels, moderator. And uh, uh, we aren't going to have any more time for call-ins because we do our... I have the last question and running, believe it or not, out of time. So let me read the last question. They're all, the guys are going, oh, thank God. They, we, they've been standing here for a long time. I get to sit. Okay, gentlemen, we'll be starting with Mr. Crudis this time, and here's the question. And this is a tough one. How do we remedy the high cost of social services in Chautauqua County, especially the part where uh, New York State is forcing us to pay a high percentage of all that? Okay, well let's, let's assume that we can't change how New York State does business <laughs> and that we have to do that. And okay. So that's a pretty good assumption right there. <laughs> uh, goes right back to my main premise. We need to start training these kids that are coming out of high school or college for jobs that they can do here and jobs they can do elsewhere. And they don't all have to be college jobs, vocational jobs. We need to have a tr these kids trained and job ready and some and college ready if that's what they choose in that case if they can get a good job that where they can see the light at the end of the tunnel where they can see progress in their life where they have a where they feel value where they're making a, a, a decent wage where it matters whether they lose that job those things will disappear on their own because a lot of those things won't be needed anymore but it's a long-range goal and it, it took us a long time to get here because I can remember this trend starting way back in the 70s. I'm just old enough to remember that. And, uh, and, and here we are, you know, uh, 40 years later. 
So, you know, it could take a lot longer to, to reverse it, or maybe it could take a short amount of time. Uh, things change in this country, and uh, things that you don't realize are going to happen, happen. But I really do, we, we, we need some vision. We need to be able to find out what, what we need to be training these, guys, these kids for when they get out of school or even when they're in high school. And, and, and I'm not talking about spending a lot of money. I'm thinking some of these, some of these uh, courses that we have in high school right now uh, could be switched over to, to another course. And just as an example, electricians. I mean, electricians can get jobs anywhere they want because uh, we are so electric oriented in this society now that we need a lot of electricians. We could have a course right here at uh, Chautauqua Lake in Sherman, in Clymer, anywhere doing electricity, uh, not on a hands-on basis, but just learning the, the physics and the principles of electricity to get them a start. And then we need to develop these vocational schools so that these kids uh, learn these and are job ready with a minimum amount of expense and time on their part so that they can get out there and start working. And if they're working and they're making uh, good money, they're not going to want to jeopardize that to be on social services. Their uh, marriages will be more steady because they don't have to worry about money. Uh, uh, alcoholism and crime will be reduced because we know that uh, crime and alcoholism does follow poverty and that's could be you could uh, question that as a chicken and egg but I really believe that uh, you know the uh, they follow po poverty uh, so that that would be my solution these are not easy we can't do those things overnight they take long range and you know what any hard problem that you try to solve isn't going to be done overnight so uh, I would say we need to, we a long-term approach in that that regard okay and thank you and mr. Himmeling Department of Social Services, we and, and I particularly uh, have had a, a, a huge aversion to all the mandates that come down from the state on, on human services. And it's because of these very lax rules, regulations that allow generations of, of, of people to get on social services and be allowed to accept social services and not force them to get out there, train for a job, attend a school or whatever it takes to build their skills so they can maintain a, or get a uh, well-paying job and get off of these uh, service, social service uh, roles. Um, you know, that's, that's the big thing. Uh, how are we going to stop it? I, it, it it's got to come through the state uh, because we have very little control over, over our social service budget. And a, even then, we've also got to go out and look at if we are, as a county, offering duplicate services that the private sector offers. And if we are, We've got to eliminate those to reduce taxes. Okay. Mr. Cruz, final thoughts on that topic? Uh, well, yeah, I'd have to agree with Dave about uh, eliminating duplicate services. Uh, uh, and I'd like to uh, expound, upon, expound about, uh, about that, but uh, I really don't know enough about what I uh, actually heard to, to say so. But I know there are some duplicate services in the Medicaid area. Uh, and I'm not sure if they're still going on with some of the things. So uh, it's one of those uh, very complex subjects that you really have to get into and see. But uh, yeah, we, if, if we can eliminate mandates like uh, Dave says, that will help us a little bit, but we have to be careful. There are people who are really in need of these services. And there's, uh, there's uh, as we know, there's people who really can't work. So we have to be careful on just what mandates we uh, get rid of or relax, whichever it is. Uh, and, you know, with reasonable heads in the legislature or at the state level, if we get somebody in, uh, get the state moving a little bit, we can do that. But, yeah, I agree with Dave. There's probably too many mandates there. Uh, it costs us a lot of money, and it goes back to uh, regionalization. Uh, the state passes laws that cover everybody, and Chautauqua County is different than any county in New York City. and 
and we need to, well, I guess I said that backwards, sorry, any county downstate. Uh, so, you know, we may need different mandates than some of those, and I think it's time for the state to start realizing that, you know, we are different. We're a different environment, different economy, and we have to run things a little differently up here. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Himmelin, last chance on that question. I get the second chance. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, you know, everything that Ed said is, you know, true. We've got uh, so many mandates out there, uh, but it is... And I'm not against anybody getting social services uh, that absolutely needs it, you know. I, and I understand there's some elderly people out there that, that, that don't even have social security coming in that, that need these services. So, and, and you know, the, there's other factors out there that, that contribute to having to spend money for, for people in our county. And I, I do not begrudge uh, one penny that is being spent on those people. Because by and by far and away, they have produced something during their life uh, that has been a benefit to this county, and uh, we need to, to help them out in their time of need. Okay, and thank you. Gentlemen, we're just about to the end of the debate. In fact, we're done debating. <laughs> All right? Uh, at this point in time, I'm going to give each candidate three uninter uninterrupted minutes to close out their, their case to you, the voters, and, uh, and we're going to start with Mr. Karudis. Anything you want to say, three minutes, you got it. Okay. I'd just like to say we, you know, we can't continue down the road we are on. We can't continue with the old ideas and philosophies that we've had that maybe we can cut our way into prosperity. We're, it's just not going to happen. It hasn't happened for anyone. Uh, in, in this nation, but uh, we can keep our uh, assets that we have, our lakes, our streams, our forest in pristine condition to draw people here because there are a lot of naturalists that like to be here. Uh, I uh, go salmon fishing with my son. We go up to uh, 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 Canada Creek up here in Fredonia and you could take a picture of the salmon jumping up a small waterfall just as if it was in Alaska. And if, uh, if you've ever talked to a fisherman that has come to this area from another area, they will tell you, you don't know what you have. And unfortunately, a lot of other people don't know what we have. Uh, we, we have to find waste, and I don't think anybody will disagree with that. And it's not just waste, it's efficiency. Uh, we need to have good workers in our county who are paid enough to, uh, that they don't want to lose their job and that they're going to do a good job. Uh, I was always taught by my father, and I'm sure Dave was too, is that you put in a good day's work, you get a good day's pay. <coughs> uh, the other is we need to create an environment that allows people to bring in new ideas, that they are not chastised or uh, uh, made to think that uh, they're criticizing their bosses. That's one of the things I've seen uh, uh, in different areas of my life is that uh, people in charge don't like to be told that they're doing something wrong, and we need to change that. We need to create an environment where uh, ideas are embraced and maybe improved and at least looked at. <clears throat> and that's what I'd like to see in, the, in our government. We need to work together to solve problems. I don't think anybody would disagree with that, but sometimes, sometimes uh, it's like a football team and we... Uh, we don't, instead of thinking we're the same, we're uh, uh, opposite party. So, uh, so what I'd like to ask uh, our, my audience, and I hope it, most of it's my audience, is, is uh, I'd like to work for the legislature. I'd like to work for you. I would work really hard to try to change things, and uh, I would just uh, like your support in all of that. Uh, I like my way of life here. I love this county. Uh, and I want to preserve this way of life that we have here because I think it's really good. We have a lot of assets here, and uh, uh, I don't want to see uh, our towns drying up and our tax taxes going up higher and higher so that uh, even more people live. And I think that will help support us throughout the, uh, the next few years if we can do that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and Mr. Himmelin, three minutes. You got Three it. minutes is all this time. Uh, no, I, I appreciate this opportunity to, uh, to answer questions and get my, my opinions out there into the public for those that haven't called me or I haven't had a chance to meet them. Uh, I do appreciate this time. Uh, I want to say that I hope that I've expanded on enough subjects that uh, they feel I am the, the better candidate. I do not want to... Uh, 
leave anybody out of any conversation that's here. Uh, if anybody has any problems that I can help at the county level, now that I'm a, a sitting legislator, uh, I just give me a phone call. Uh, my number's in the book, telephone book. Uh, give me a call. I will do what I can to, to help you in your situation. Uh, and hopefully, like, like I said, I have expanded on my thoughts on, on several subjects. Some of them uh, we haven't touched on, but uh, I really would appreciate uh, your support come November 5th. Thank you. Thank you. All right, folks, uh, we're going to be wrapping up things here now at the, today's debate. If you're from Minot, Finley Lake, uh, Sherman, Chautauqua, Mayville, or DeWittville, I hope that you've had an opportunity to, to see and hear your candidates. And uh, I want to thank you, Mr. Karudis and Mr. Himmeline, for taking time from your busy schedule. I'm sure you've been knocking on doors and Ooh, having oh yeah. chicken dinners and all that <laughs> stuff and getting your, your literature out there. Um, but we think this was important, and, and I hope you do too. I want to thank all of you, you uh, viewers that have uh, tuned in today. We hope this was helpful to you. And I want to thank those that did call in and, and give us your uh, questions. Um, I want to give special thanks to Chris Burt. Uh, he's our producer, and this was his, uh, his baby. He put it all together for us. Uh, Jeff Zook, our engineer. Randy Burt, our cameraman, has been shoot, running around here on a gimpy foot taking pictures. And uh, did a lot of the uh, work behind the scenes of putting together the, the equipment and so forth. This show will be uh, rebroadcasted, folks, throughout the week on Cable Access 5. And hopefully you can see it uh, throughout the county in different um, channels. Also, it's going to be on YouTube. You can look it up there if you like. We hope this debate was informative and gave each candidate the opportunity to let you know where he stands on each issue. Next week, folks, should prove to be just as interesting and informative when we have Mr. Vince Horrigan and Mr. Ron Johnson, both candidates for the Office of uh, County Executive. They'll be debating right here uh, October 19th at noon. I will be moderating once again. And uh, I would like to thank every one of you for joining us. I'm Doc Hamels. I look forward to seeing all of you again this time next week.